Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm going to start with the introductions. My name is Haley, and I work with the Columbia Mountains Institute of Applied Ecology, and that's CMI for short. And I join you today from Revelstoke to present the third talk in our fifth season of CRED Talks, the Columbia Region Ecological Discussions. Um, today we're here to we're here to hear we are here to hear from Blair Smith, who will share some insights in a talk titled "The Swallow Hotel: Compensation Habitat for Barn Swallows in the Creston Valley Wildlife Management Area." Accompanying Blair, we have two others online with us today who will contribute to the discussion during our Q and A. We have Marc Andre Bocher, manager for the Creston Valley Wildlife Management Area, and Jeremy Appleton a last minute addition, so thanks for joining Jeremy, and he's field biologist with Metro Vancouver. Before we get started, and while we have people continuing to log on to this webinar, I'm just going to take the opportunity to tell you a little bit about CMI for those who are not familiar. And for those of you who have heard my spiel many times, perhaps three times already in the last couple of weeks, I apologize and thank you for your patience. Um, CMI is a nonprofit society we're an association for people working in the various fields of ecology. Our home range is Southern British Columbia, Canada, but increasingly we're seeing membership from across BC into Alberta, the Yukon and the Northwest Territories. One of, our main, one of the main things we do is provide professional development opportunities such as conferences and courses. And so some examples from the last couple of years include an intro to wildlife bioacoustics course, advanced field ornithology courses, wetland classification courses, plant ID courses, critical habitat screening workshops, a variety of statistical methods workshops and courses, and then a diversity of conferences that explore more complex topics like the ecology of regulated rivers, for example, or incidental take of migratory birds, or the assessment of camera trap surveys for wildlife mon monitoring. Our website, of course, is the best place to learn more about the things we do and it contains great resources such as preceding documents from all of our major events. And you can find that at cmiae.org. And I have that uh, website address up on the right hand side of your screen. For this particular project, the uh, CRED Talks, this is our first year that we've moved to webinar format. Uh, so thank you COVID, of course, and um, welcome to everyone who's here as a result of this event going online. I think that you probably find it interesting to know who's on the webinar right now. We've been really very happy and surprised by who's able to log on now that we've gone to the online format. So I think this would be a fantastic opportunity for us to just practice the chat feature. I know that I've received a few emails from people who've never done Zoom before. So I guess welcome to your first Zoom experience. Hopefully it's working well for you. And um, what we're gonna do now is take your mouse and hover it near the bottom of your screen. And when you do that, you should see a control panel pop up. And on that control panel, you'll see a little button that says chat. And if you hit chat, what I'd like you to do is type in your name and where you're from and your affiliation or the organization you're with. And we'll start to see a whole bunch of messages populating your chat. And it's pretty neat to see who's on board with us today. Interestingly, I'm not getting anything in the chat. Are you? Oh, here we go. Here it comes. Okay, fantastic. So it's pretty fun to scroll through there and see who's online. Um, as is typical for our events, I think you'll find that we have a really great mix of people here. We have a mix of academics, students, environmental consultants, industry representatives, and government resources. Or so that's what I could determine from the registration that I saw. At this time, I'd like to thank our sponsor, the Columbia Basin Trust, for their financial support of this series. Without your, their support, and I also wanted to emphasize without your donations that many of you provided today, this project would not be possible. So thank you very much. And before I get into the nitty gritty details, I wanted to acknowledge and honor the four nations on whose traditional territory I broadcast from today, the Sinaiaks, the Tanaha, the Sequapam, and the Silk. Okay, so now for those nitty gritty details. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and it'll be posted to our website later today. 
All attendees have been muted for the session. So the best way for you to communicate with us is through that chat feature that all of you just, or most of you anyways, just tested out. We'll have time for questions at the end. So to pose a question, simply type that into the chat. You can type it into the chat as Blair is speaking, but we will not ask the question until the end. But feel free to pose those questions into the chat as they come up. And now, enough talking from me, I'm going to introduce Blair Smith. So Blair Smith is a graduate of Recreation Fish and Wildlife Programming, prog from, sorry, the Recreation Fish and Wildlife Program at Selkirk College, and she's working towards her Bachelor of Science in Wildlife and Fisheries at the University of Northern BC. She's recently completed an undergraduate thesis focusing on anti-predator response to mountain chickadees in urban versus rural habitats. Currently, Blair is employed as a wildlife technician for the Creston Valley Wildlife Management Area, where she monitors species including western grebe, northern leopard frog, American bullfrog, and the barn swallow. So Blair, I'm gonna unshare my screen and you can share yours. Great. Um, here we go. Great, that worked. Excellent, you can see my screen. I can see it. Perfect. All right. Thanks for the introduction, Haley. And welcome to the viewers. Thanks for tuning in today. I'd also like to thank CMI for hosting the CRED talk and having me here. I'll also acknowledge that the Creston Valley Wildlife Management Area is located on the traditional lands of the Lower Kootenai Band of the Tanaha Nation. So a bit of an outline for you today. I'll start with some background information on the Creston Valley Wildlife Management Area. I'll provide a brief overview on our study species, barn swallows. Then I'll describe how the Swallow Hotel came about. And to do that, we need to know a little bit about the old interpretive center. Next, I'll touch on our results to date and wrap up with some of our next steps. The Creston Valley Wildlife Management Area is located in the West Kootenays of BC, and it stretches from Corn Creek in the south to Kootenay Lake in the north. And there's also a small compartment uh, just north of the Idaho border. On the east and west, it's bordered by the Purcell and Selkirk Mountains. And um, you can see on these maps, Creston is highlighted with a red dot the left map should give you a bit of a sense of where Creston sits within the rivers and mountains of the Kootenays. And then the right map, uh, the management area is highlighted in yellow. And you can see it compared to uh, the location of the town of Creston. The management area is made up of a variety of habitats, including upland forest, wetland, lake, and agricultural fields. And the image on the right should give you a little bit of an idea of what it looks like. And it's also a shot of Corn Creek, where most of the work that I'll be talking about today took place. The management area is a governmental nonprofit aimed at conserving and managing the wetland, uh, and in particular waterfowl. It was established in 1968 and was actually the first wildlife management area in BC. It's recognized as a wetland of international significance under Ramsar. It's an important uh, Canadian important bird and biodiversity area and is also an important amphibian and reptile area in Canada. Our mission is to manage 7,000 hectares of wetland and associated habitats to maintain the management area's international significance for conservation of waterfowl, as well as other migratory birds and wildlife, including listed or at-risk species. And barn swallows are one of the at-risk species in the management area, so they fit nicely into our mission. And before I move on to project specifics, I just want to talk about this uh, neat species. 
So barn swallows, Hirundo rustica, are a songbird with a blue back, an orange belly, chestnut throat, and a forked tail. You can see a nice little video of one here. Males and females are visually pretty similar, but males tend to have a more deeply forked tail and also a darker uh, chest and throat. They're the most widely distributed swallow across the world, and they're found on every continent except Antarctica. But, uh, sorry, here in Canada, they breed in every province and territory, but even though they are widespread across Canada, it doesn't mean their population is stable. So the Breeding Bird Survey estimates that across Canada, their population has declined by 76% uh, between 1970 and 2009. And here in BC, the population is also declining by about 5% per year. And again, that's breeding bird survey data. So that has resulted in our province um, a listing of blue, meaning they are a species of special concern. And in Canada, they're listed as threatened, meaning the species is likely to become endangered if nothing is done. And I have a few little interesting facts for you. Barn swallows were actually the first bird species other than those used in falconry to receive legal protection and that happened in 1946. They're also the first passerine, meaning perching bird, to be banded. And there's a number of interesting legends associated with them. So maybe this is because they're so widely distributed. So for instance, one is that they stole fire from the gods to give to the people. And when the gods threw a fireball at them, it burnt their central tail feathers, leaving them with a forked tail. And in many areas, it's considered good luck if you have them on your property. Barn swallows are aerial insectivores, meaning that they rely on flying insects all year round. Some important components of their habitat include open areas like rural fields or wetlands used for foraging. A uh, body of water is important that provides mud for nest building and cover is also very important for nesting. Originally, they nested in caves and on cliff faces, but now they've almost completely switched to anthropogenic structures like bridges, culverts, sheds, and barns. And now they're rarely seen nesting on those original uh, natural substrates. Beginning in April or May, they build a cup-shaped mud nest like the one you can see here. They're typically under some sort of overhang or attached to a rafter or beam. And it may take the male and female about 1,200 trips to bring back mud pellets to build their nest. They're, they typically have one to two broods each year, and those broods have four to five eggs. And after breeding, most birds depart their breeding grounds by late September when they migrate to Central and South America to overwinter. But adults are known to return to the same nesting colony and some even use the very same nest the following year. So I mentioned that their population is declining. So what are some of the pressures causing this? Cold snaps and rainy weather during the breeding season cause starvation of nestlings and adults and climate change is definitely contributing to this increasingly variable weather. They're also facing large scale declines of their food source, insects. And one of the reasons causing those declines being pesticide use. They're also facing habitat loss, old derelict buildings with existing nesting colonies get torn down. And as we shift from building materials like wood to metal, 
to yeah metal being used as a building material it can become harder for them to affix their nest to that material and also as we shift from conventional farming practices to more, more modern techniques it reduces both nesting and foraging habitat it's also thought that mortality may be high on overwintering grounds, but the cause of this mortality, at least for our North American birds, is not very well understood. Predators probably aren't causing population level declines, but they do include hawks, owls, corvids, raccoons, and weasels. And this picture here are uh, two of the nestlings that didn't make it through this year. We aren't exactly sure what caused their death, but it could have been related to high temperatures that we had this summer. So now that I've introduced the management area and barn swallows in general, how the heck did we get into swallow hospitality? And this is where it comes back to the interpretive center, which is what I'll talk about next. It was built in 1974 and quickly became an iconic part of the Creston Valley. I definitely have very fond memories of elementary school trips to visit the center and maybe some of you do as well. So in addition to the many people who visited over the years, Barnes Hall has also visited and built a nesting colony under the structure. And here we have a photo just to give you a bit of a sense of what that looked like. So what you're looking at, um, the pilings are the supports of the old interpretive center. And the nests are a bit tricky to see, so I've circled some of them here, but on the right is also a close up of some of those nests. So even though the swallows nested under the center, unfortunately, the old building didn't meet public use standards anymore and it was closed in 2017 and was slated for demolition. But before demolition began, we did surveys to document the breeding activity of the barn swallows, and that occurred in the spring and summer of 2018 and 2019. And these surveys were really in an effort to understand what the effects of remo removing the building may be. We did these surveys from May to September, and they were generally done midday to early afternoon when swallows are most active and often foraging away from their nest. However, we did not do surveys in heavy rain, and we also avoided the hottest times of the day to avoid thermal stress to the young. Surveying was done every four to seven days on average once a week to check the nest status. And we used a few different extendable mirrors and GoPro to look inside the nests. But if adults or older chicks were on the nest, we just watched from afar. And now I'll go into a little bit more detail on what we might see during those uh, nest checks. And these next few photos are going to be from all over the management area, not necessarily the interpretive center, but I use them because they're just good examples of what we might see. So first, a nest could be inactive like this one here, no signs of nesting activity. Uh, maybe earlier in the season there was, but not anymore. Or a nest could be under construction. That might look like new mud, grass lining, uh, feathers being added. This nest pictured here was about a quarter of the size of an average nest, so we knew it was still being worked on. Or we might see eggs or an incubating bird. And on the left, it's great to get a count of the eggs when we could, but on the right is an example of when we would just watch from afar. Getting an egg count uh, wasn't important enough to risk disturbing an incubating bird. Or we might see hatchlings. And again, we'd get a count when we could. 
It was surprisingly challenging to tell how many individuals were in the nest when their little pink bodies just kind of blurred together. And then as they got older, we would see fledglings. And at this point, we were especially careful to watch from a distance because we didn't want to cause premature fledging. And another piece of information we collected was the age of the nestlings. We separated their age into four categories, and these are simplified age classes based on a guide published in the literature in 2012. If anyone wants more information about that, I can definitely get that reference to you afterwards. And watching the chicks progress through these stages right from an egg to a fledgling was definitely my favorite part of surveying. I especially enjoyed watching the fledglings. They just seemed like they had so much personality. And I have a quick video to show you what I mean. Hopefully you enjoyed that as much as I do. Okay, so in 2018, we had 41 pre-existing nests at the beginning of our surveying season. Mm -hmm. And throughout the season, there were 53 new nests built. In total, we estimated there were 61 nesting attempts. Uh, nesting attempts meaning that they had eggs or nestlings at some point throughout the season, but weren't necessarily all successful. And based on the timing of those 61 attempts, we estimated that there were 34 pairs. But because these birds aren't banded or marked, we can't identify individuals. So we are making some assumptions in order to come up with this pair estimate. Uh, so generally, we noticed that after a nest fledged, we would see signs of either a new nest being initiated in the same nest cup or with a, a new nest being built nearby. And that seemed to often happen within about a week of the initial uh, nest fledging. So in those cases, we inferred that it was the same pair starting their second nesting attempt. And comparing to 2019, there were more pre-existing nests and less new nests built, but a very similar result for the number of nesting attempts and similar pair estimate. In 2019, we did increase our survey effort uh, by nearly double because it was the last year that collecting data would be possible. Uh, before the center was demolished. So we really just wanted to get as much information uh, about the colony as we could. And these two photos here are some of the nests that were under the center in 2019. So after those two years of surveying, the Interbra Center was demolished in the winter of 2019-2020. And it's important to note that this work began after the swallows finished breeding and they had left the area for their migration. Okay, so that finally brings us to the Swallow Hotel and its purpose was to provide an alternative nesting structure to compensate for the loss of the interpretive center. It was constructed in the fall of 2018 before the interpretive center was demolished. And that's important because swallows tend to check out a new nesting area the year before they use it. Our design was definitely experimental, but it was based on the structure of the interpretive center and photos of uh, some local sheds and barns that have been used as nesting colonies here in the Creston Valley. 
We wanted it to be big enough to provide space for the pairs from the interpreter center and we ended up settling on 816 square feet. We wanted it to be close to water and we wanted it to have partitioning in the ceiling. And it was recommended to us from the Canadian Wildlife Service that it be less than one kilometer away from the old uh, interpretive center. So here is the location we settled on. And just to get you situated, if you're leaving Creston on Highway 3A, or Highway 3, um, you turn south onto West, West Creston Road, and here's the parking lot of the old interpretive center where the Kootenai Columbia Discovery Center is now located. And if you want to walk to the Swallow Hotel, you can leave from this parking lot here. Oh, it looks like my mouse froze up. Oh, there we go. You can leave from the parking lot there, walk along the dike, and it takes, uh, it's one or two kilometers walk. So this location uh, ended up being 600 meters away from the old interpretive center and it provided easy access for our monitoring and it was close to water. Now I have just a few photos of the construction of the Swallow Hotel. So this one, uh, the framing's gone up and the roof just went on. Here we're looking at the underside of the ceiling and you can see the partitions that I mentioned, the kind of square recesses in the ceiling. And we made them three feet by three feet based on an average distance between nests uh, that we found in the literature. So if one nest was built in each recess, there would be space for 56 nests, uh, but that's just the inside of the building. So there's also space on the walls and the outside of the building that I'm not including in that 56 total. And now we're looking from the outside. Um, you can see that the ceiling kind of overhangs the wall. We weren't exactly sure if they would like nesting on the inside or the outside. And it's a bit hard to see in this photo, but the wall doesn't quite reach the ceiling. So there is space there for perching and for birds to enter and exit. There's also open windows for flight in and out. And here we're looking at the inside. Again, you can see those square recesses in the ceiling and lots of space uh, support beams for perching. And our last step was to add 38 artificial nesting cups. And we did this for a few different reasons. It seems that swallows like nesting on a support and we know they reuse nests but uh, nests do fall down during the breeding season, sometimes with eggs and hatchlings in them. So we hope that this might prevent some of those failed nests and also just in general, encourage them to use the Swallow Hotel. So we placed these nest cups in every second partition in the ceiling. And that's because barn swallows, just like humans, do like a bit of privacy when they settle into their nest. They don't necessarily want to be too close to another pair. Now for the Swallow Hotel results, um, and actually just before I mentioned that, uh, we used the same methodology that we used for surveying the interpretive center that I described earlier. And here's a photo of me on the left using one of those extendable mirrors to have a peek inside a nest cup. So in 2019, adults were seen flying around and perching on the Swallow Hotel uh, around May. And then by mid-June, a pair had begun building a nest in one of the artificial nest cups. And you can see that nest pictured here. And then by early July, three chicks hatched, and by the end of July, they fledged. So this photo is um, of the very first chicks that hatched in the Swallow Hotel. 
And we were actually very surprised that a pair used the structure in 2019. It was pretty unexpected because as I mentioned earlier, swallows typically uh, check out their nest spot a year before they use it. But that wasn't possible in this case because the Swallow Hotel was built in the fall of 2018. So this pair couldn't have investigated it during their previous breeding season. So we were quite, quite happy that a pair moved in the very first year. Then in 2020, three pairs nested, six nests were built, all using the artificial nesting cups. And you'll notice that uh, there's six nests, but only three pairs. So again, based on the timing of the nest, it seemed like after a nest fledged, about a week would pass and a new nest would be under construction. So I think that each of the three pairs fledged their first brood, moved to a new artificial nesting cup and had their second brood uh, rather than six different pairs. They used nests facing all four aspects um, and three of them were facing west, but it's probably too early to tell if that's a pattern. 17 nestlings fledged, uh, but one of the second nesting attempts was a nest of three nestlings that failed and it could have been that it was just too late in the season to be successful or possibly due to the high temperatures that I mentioned earlier. Um, of course, we would like to see these numbers continue to increase, and we do think they will. Uh, it's also interesting to note that in 2020, we noticed uh, a number of nests being built in new places around the management area. So for instance, on a bridge, one of our observation towers, the office itself, and on some small sheds. So it kind of looks like the colony from the Interpretive Center has spread out across Corn Creek in a number of nesting locations. Overall, we're pretty pleased and we think it shows early success, but we're definitely looking forward to uh, seeing what next year will bring. And I just have another video clip of some of the fledglings exercising their wings in the Swallow Hotel. Okay, so like I said, we think it shows early success, but we do have a few ideas uh, for Swallow Hotel upgrades. One being adding a source of mud near the hotel, and that would be used for building nests. We've also thought about adding a perching wire on the outside, and this photo should give you a sense of why we're considering that. This was taken uh, beside the old interpretive center and there's 164 barn swallows using that perching wire. Yes, I counted. We have also considered excluding predators. This raccoon was the only predator that our trail cam caught uh, this last season using the Swallow Hotel. Uh, it wasn't able to reach any of the nests but depending where the nests, depending where future nests are located, if it becomes a problem, we would definitely consider adding some uh, metal baffling around the base of the Swallow Hotel, hopefully to prevent them from climbing up. And we've also talked about excluding humans from the structure. We don't think it's a huge problem. Uh, we also have a sign on the entrance uh, that just explains what the structure is for and requests that people avoid it during breeding season. But the few humans that we did catch inside seemed like they were just curious children. We also have an architect drawing up the building plans for the Swallow Hotel and we think that'll be a great resource when it's completed. 
Over the next few years, we definitely want to continue our annual monitoring of the Swallow Hotel. And eventually, uh, that frequency of the monitoring will decrease to every second year. But we are talking about an at-risk species, and we know that aerial insectivores in general are declining. So we definitely want to continue that uh, long-term monitoring of the population. So in summary, I introduced the Creston Valley Wildlife Management Area, talked about our study species, barn swallows, give you a bit of history of the old interpretive center and how that led to the building of the Swallow Hotel, touched on our uh, first results to date and some of our ideas for moving forwards. So thank you for listening and for your interest in learning about our Swallow Hotel here at the Creston Valley Wildlife Management Area. I'd like to acknowledge the people who made this project happen. So Mark andre Head of Conservation Programs and Julia, Conservation Programs Assistant. They were very heavily involved in the planning of both the structure itself and of implementing um, monitoring and survey protocol to Madeline and Isabel who were involved in data collection in the past and to Brody wildlife habitat and operations technician who helped with data collection this summer and uh, also a special thank you to Linda Van Dam for providing her recommendations on the Swallow host Hotel structure uh, based on her many years of monitoring barn swallows in the Creston Valley and lastly, thanks again to CMI for hosting me here today and coordinating the awesome CRED talks. Uh, I'd like to say if anyone has questions that they don't feel comfortable asking in front of the group, don't hesitate to email me at the address on screen. Or if anyone is interested in uh, my references, feel free to ask for a copy and I can send that along to you. And with that, that wraps up my presentation for today. Haley, I think you're muted. Take two. Um, so I was just saying thank you. I think what we're going to do instead of jumping into questions, we've got a couple questions right here um, and, and some, some thank yous that have popped up as well. But we're going to hop on over to Jeremy Appleton right now. So if you can unshare your screen. Yep. I'm going to pop up a new slide. Mm, there we go. Great. There we go. Okay, do we see um, a really fantastic hairdo? <laughs> you look more blonde, Jeremy, in the photo than you do in real life. Yeah. Um, thanks, everyone. I'm actually sorry, I just lost my notes, so I have to bring this over and try again. Okay, so I just want to introduce Jeremy. Um, we've brought him on because he's been doing some interesting and, and really similar work. So I'm going to give him an opportunity to ask his questions first and then um, share really briefly what, what he's been doing. So Jeremy's been working with Metro Vancouver Water Services for 10 years, five of those spent as the local field biologist. His prim primary work areas are um, with the three enclosed watersheds. So that's the Capilano, Seymour, and Coquitlam, which encompass 60,000 acres, um, hectares, sorry, and provide drinking water for the 2.5 million residents of the Lower Mainland. He also works throughout the water utility between Lions Bay and Maple Ridge. Areas of interest include fish and wildlife, species at risk, songbirds and raptors, invasive species, forest health, hydrology, and water quality. So Jeremy, thanks very much. Um, what are your, oh, I'm just realized I was on the wrong side. Why don't you um, pipe in for a few minutes? Sure, yeah, thank you very much for having me today. Um, it's quite topical for us. Um, a few years ago, barn swallows were identified in our, our boathouses on our drinking water reservoirs and at a security building um, at one of our dams. 
And the mud and the droppings uh, were noted as potentially unhygienic for our reservoir water sampling program, uh, which is used to make sure that our drinking water is safe. Um, the, as you know, the droppings can be quite prolific and we're covering our equipment essentially. Um, these bolt houses are older buildings that float on pontoons and they have many areas for barn swallows to enter. Um, and like I said, the nests were kind of built all over inside the buildings. Um, so we began to have internal staff look at options for solutions, or sorry, look at um, yeah, solution options like exclusion, compensation. Um, and after that brief review, then we engaged a local barn swallow expert to conduct a formal review and understand the, um, the specific requirements around whether exclusion would be possible, uh, best management practices, and then potentially how compensation could work. Um, so as a result of that, uh, we had a report from this consultant which included that information as well as the option uh, for coexistence. Um, so it's, it was a bit of a nuanced, nuanced model, like um, coexistence focused on uh, str strategically excluding barn swallows from areas that we didn't want them in our boathouses and we used metal flashing and wood and such to do that, but then supporting them um, to nest in areas that, that would be okay for us and that, could, that would be easy to coexist with us. So that was one section of it. And then the next section was putting up compensation structures very similar to what Blair showed. And they were recommended to be less than a kilometer from original habitat. Uh, our structures were a little bit smaller than, than what Blair has, and you can see on the slide there, the one on the left. Um, and so then um, part of that was a suggested three-year monitoring plan with an annual report from Metro Vancouver staff. So we, we accepted that report. Um, we reviewed it and, and decided to move forward with the recommendations. So over a couple of years, we do now have a current model of um, Placing, we placed exclusion netting throughout our boathouses. Uh, we put nest cups, similar to what Blair showed there, in our boathouses. And actually, they almost look identical, so I'm wondering if they potentially came from the same place. Um, we installed divider screens between the nest cups. Uh, these were vertical wooden panels to minimize lateral visibility. And we understood that those were an important factor to encourage nesting and that's similar to what Blair mentioned as well. Um, we decided to leave our boathouse doors open during the nest season of May 1 to uh, October 31st. And again, that was just to encourage that coexistence model. And then um, we did put up two wood compensation structures we'd call them barn swallow hotels too, um, with 12 cups in each. And so the cups are um, facing suitable forage habitat and we did have the metal barriers up along the posts as you can see on the, on the slide there and with the hope of keeping out uh, predators. Uh, we conducted our weekly monitoring uh, during the nest season from shore. So we aren't, we weren't, able to provide as detailed results, but we do know that um, uh, the majority of the cups in the Capilano boathouse and a good portion of them in the Seymour boathouse were occupied. Um, we didn't have any cups occupied in our shelters, but we think that's because we put them up earlier in the year and they hadn't had a, the barn swallows hadn't had a chance to, to see those compensation structures yet. So. Um, sorry, we didn't, we didn't have any nesting in our compensation structures and we felt that that's because they hadn't had a chance to see them yet. So we're hopeful that next year we should see some nesting in there. Uh, we, do, we do think there was some signage and potentially education opportunities. So our CMAR uh, compensation structure was near, near a area that's accessible to public um, a picnic site and so we put a good buffer back from that picnic site but we are hoping that people will be able to see that you know compensation is an option when you're when you're needing to either exclude barn swallows or remove old buildings and things like that. Um, so uh, we're a rather large-scale utility with many old buildings that house operations and and uh, maintenance program so we expect to run into this challenge again um, in our infrastructure and so we're hoping to kind of use this as sort of a 
in conjunction with our other BMPs and such as sort of a model going forward. I think that's kind of it from us. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit shorter and a little bit of a lighter version, I think, of what uh, what Blair presented, but essentially trying to accomplish some similar things. Great, thanks, Jeremy. Um, okay, that's fantastic. I think so, everyone. What we're going to do is, if you have any questions, you could put them in your chat there. Um, I've got a couple that have come up so far, and I'll start with those. So, um, and Jeremy and. Blair, you could both answer these, but I think that the questions were initially intended for Blair and, and of course, Mark andre you pop in and answer as you um, can as well. So the first question comes from Diane Cooper and she just says, are, there, are the artificial nests hollow cup shapes? And then her other question, which I think is interesting is, is there any documentation comparing parasites in artificial versus natural nests? So yes, they are hollow uh, cup shape, kind of to mimic what a nest would look like. Um, as for comparing parasites, not that I'm aware of. It seems like, although there are some compensation structure, structures in existence, there haven't been a lot published on them as far as results. So I think that's a really interesting idea, but uh, Marc-Andre, did you come across anything comparing parasite load? No, I haven't really um, researched it too, too much, but um, yeah, I, I suspect it, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, something to, something to investigate perhaps. Mm -hmm. okay. So Elka wins, she says, why couldn't you, why couldn't the original floor and pilings be left in place? Was that considered? Do you think that the use of wood versus original concrete may have been the issue for nesting? Example, change thermal conditions. I, yeah, go ahead. Um, as far as leaving the uh, original pilings in the floor, I don't think it was very uh, logistically feasible for safety concerns. Um, do you have anything to add there, Marc Andre? Yeah, and also the the piles that on which the centers stood was um, they were all treated with creosote, so mm -hmm. it was identify as sort of a hazardous material, you know, in the wetland, which was really ideal. Um, mm -hmm. So it was as part of the project, and also separating the, the floor, and yeah, it, be, it becomes a public liability. So we we did consider it, but um, we also had bats in the visitor center, and uh, we had to consider it as turning the the thing into a huge bat condo, but um, didn't really <laughs> lead anywhere. So we actually also built a bat condo for to mitigate for the presence of bats that were in in the in the center, um, in the same general area as the where the <laughs> Swallow Hotel was built. And um, the underneath the underside of the center was not concrete; it was all wood, pretty much too. So. Um, we don't think that, um, you know, in terms of thermal conditions, uh, it, it, we, we did put um, some, data, some um, temperature data loggers on the center for a year. And then we also have one in the, um, in the bat, uh, uh, sorry, in the Swallow Hotel. So, but we haven't compared the temperatures yet. So we have something we'll have to do over the winter to see how they compare. Um, but I was part of closing the, the Swallow Hotel to, to uh, like boarded around is to try to keep it maybe cooler and leave those space in between the boards. Um, so we'll have, to, we'll have to see uh, what the temperature difference looks like. I, I suspect that it was probably a little bit cooler on the center because it was probably more insulated, but um, it doesn't seem to be affecting the swallow so far. Great, thanks for answering that. Um, next question comes from Harry Van Oort. And uh, he says, you mentioned that the Creston Hotel was 816 square feet. What was the height of, on the lower end of the new structure? The new structure? Andre, do you want to take this one? <laughs> hey, <Ari. laughs> it says the structure actually, but. Yeah, so the, so the, the front of the building um, is, uh, I believe it's 12 feet tall. And then the back of the building is about um, eight feet at the highest. And uh, I'm just looking at some old drawings that I did here. And uh, yeah, so, and, and hopefully uh, Harry will be able to provide you with some plans as soon as we have them here. I think the, the retired architect has been working on the plans. 
So um, yeah, and, and it's uh, it's the built the building itself is twenty four foot wide, I know twenty four foot long by eighteen feet wide, and um, so I think um, that would be the the square footage of the structure. Right. Okay. Um, there's a follow up comment from Diane Cooper. I'll just read it. She says, "I think thermal conditions of wood versus natural mud might be something too." I also wonder if barn swallows gain anything biologically from collecting mud. Good comment there. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Diane. Um, okay, I've got a question from Rachel Darville here. Let's paste it up so I can see it better. Um, okay. Were there any structures considered when planning the design, such as those structures that have been used Ont uh, by Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, and as listed in those BARS, B-A-R-S, all caps, Compensation Nesting Habitat Guide? Um, we're planning to build some BARS structures in the Columbia Valley next year, but we're thinking of trying a few different prototypes um, to see what type of structure is most effective. If you have any specific advice on design, I'd love to chat about it more. Seems like there are several different plans out there. Yeah, Rachel is going a step first, trying to serve alcohol to the to the swallows by <laughs> a bar is not a hotel. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, yeah, we did we did look at some of the plans that were from Ontario, and I, I actually contacted some of the folks out there, and and from my understanding is they didn't have much success with some of the structures they had they had built at the time. So that was already like almost like two years ago, two, three years ago. So um, maybe they do have some structures now that have been more successful. But um, yeah, uh, we, one thing I think it's important is um, maybe the size, you know, like by going sort of a bit bigger than too small, like from what I'd seen, it seems like, you know, you may be offering something that we don't really know about to the swallows. Um, so I would, you know, I, my feeling was uh, going over a whole bunch of structures in the valley here that had been used by, by barn swallows nesting. Um, it seems like size maybe is an important factor, but a few, uh, obviously you have to um, balance that with budgets and, and you know, and an easy of, of a, like um, ease of construction. So yeah, uh, but yeah, if you have more questions, Rachel, give us a call and we can, we can chat about it. Great, thanks. Okay, I think um, I think that might be it for questions at this time. Any final comments before we close off? I just want to say thanks to uh, Jeremy for sharing. That's really interesting to see the similarities, and hopefully we can stay in touch and share what we learn. That's great. Thanks very much, you guys. Um, and yeah, lots of thank yous in the chat to all of you. So I'm just going to close off by highlighting that we've got another talk coming up. Um, these are so great. I'm, I'm so appreciative for everybody getting online, Marc-Andre, Blair and Jeremy and sharing your knowledge and everybody who's signing on to participate in the conversation as, as stilted as it can be online. Um, we still managed to get some great comments and questions happening. Um, so our next talk is by Greg Utzig with Kootenai Nature Investigations, and he'll be delivering a talk titled Climate Change and the Biodiversity Crisis. So, you know, it's not going to be an uplifting talk, but um, I, I just say that every time I hear Greg speak, I learn so much and I'm amazed by his depth of knowledge and experience. And I think this next talk will be relevant to anybody working in ecology. So I encourage you to tune in. Um, tune in and uh, that'll take place on November 26, 2020 and of course there's information and registration on our website or you can email me as many of you already have for more information and questions. Um, thanks for your time everyone. <laughs>